But for our purpose, the key economic fact here, just looking at this map, is the east-west connection between the northeast and the old northwest. When Abraham Lincoln was a young guy, he twice, this is in the late 1820s, let's say, or mid-1820s, he twice, he was living in southern Indiana, he twice took a flatboat down the Mississippi River to New Orleans to sell farm produce from southern Indiana down in New Orleans. And in the 1820s and 30s, that was the main route for Western agriculture, down the Ohio River, down the Mississippi River, to New Orleans where it would be marketed. But the railroad reorients that tra trade completely. By the 1850s, this farm produce is going east, not south. No longer would people like Lincoln or young men like that be traveling on flatboats down the river to, um, to bring goods to market. Now they're going to eastern cities to, um, to uh, either be sold there or maybe some of it exported to Britain and Europe. Cincinnati, a great metropolis of this era, in the 1840s, uh, and uh, called Porkopolis. Anyone here from Cincinnati? I don't know if they still call it that. It was a center for hogs, pigs, you know, all that uh, slaughtering of, of, uh, of animals like that, meat production. And um, in the 1840s, 96% of the goods sent out of Cincinnati went down the Ohio and River, Mississippi rivers. By 1860, only 16% was sent down those rivers. The rest, 84%, is sent east on railroads. This economic linkage ends, you might almost say, John C. Calhoun had always had this dream of a alliance, a political alliance between the South and the Old Northwest, an alliance of agricultural regions. He said, we all share the same interests. Slavery is not a problem. We share the same agricultural interests. Well, th this, can no this is no longer in the cards once the economic connections of the Old Northwest are shifted um, eastward. Um, now, um, as, so as I say, the, the other side of this then is the, this is the, this is the economic base, you might say, on which the Republican Party will emerge, a political alliance of the Northeast and the Old Northwest, where the economic connections have grown so, um, so dramatically. Now, in the East, of course, this period also sees the expansion of factory production, the early Industrial Revolution gathering steam. Um, because the shadow of the old Beardian interpretation of the Civil War as a contest between industry and agriculture still you know, hangs over <laughs> talking about the Civil War, I always feel it's necessary to say, we're not yet talking about a really industrialized economy. It's certainly outside of New England. There are a lot of factories, no question about it, in New England, some in upstate New York, around Philadelphia. Um, but uh, there were large-scale factories, mass-producing goods for markets, especially textile mills, you know, producing, producing cotton, cotton goods of one kind or another. Um, but, um, and you know, this was significant uh, in terms of uh, commodity production. But, and, and here in fact, wait, I have to find this. Um, here's another image I want to show you. Uh, here's an image of Bridgewater, Massachusetts, okay, in the 1850s. A small industrial city. But now look, you may remember, or maybe you don't, but the first week, we show, I showed a picture of another industri of a factory in the countryside in Pennsylvania. Now here it's a little different. This is a city. This is not a, a countryside. Here the railroad is dominating the foreground. You see, there it is. And then there's railroad tracks there and, and, and further up. There are smokestacks all around pouring smoke into the air. There are little factories in this town kind of overshadowing what is what the rest of the town is. And the artist here is not quite as optimistic, I would say, about the harmony between industrial production and nature that the previous artist 20 years earlier felt he could portray, a factory you could barely see in the wilderness. Here, this is an industrial setting with a railroad right in the front. Um, 
And, uh, but much more typical still in the 1850s was small scale manufacturing. There were big factories, but most manufacturing took place in small shops. The average number of employees in an industrial or a manufacturing establishment was under 10. We should not think of this as, you know, Pittsburgh in the 1890s or Detroit, Ford in the early 20th century. These are, these are small scale. Most production is still small, um, small scale. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it is industrial, early industrialization is being stimulated by this market expansion, by the railroad, and not only the railroad, I want to emphasize, the telegraph. 50,000 miles of tele the telegraph invented in 1844 by Alexander Graham Bell. By 1860, there are something like 50,000 miles of telegraph wire strung in the, that, that's as important a number as the 30,000 miles of railroad, uh, of railroad track. And then the ocean going steamship. By this time, transportation between the United States and Europe had been cut, the time had been cut significantly by these ocean going uh, steamships making exports to England or, or in Europe all that, uh, that much easier. Now it is true that, the, you know, as I say, we're in an early stage. There's no Pacific Railroad. There's no oil industry. There's no steel industry. There's no large corporations like we'll develop in the post-Civil War era. And in fact, um, as I say, equally typical of production is still the old, old type of artisan production. Here's a chair or furniture factory, okay? in New York City, and here are people working, making chairs, making tables, in a way that is not very different from how people made those things 100 years or 200 years before. It's hand labor, there's no machinery, there's no technology, it's a skilled craft, and um, there are a lot of workshops like this producing goods, as well as these um, larger scale factories. So, my point is, we cannot describe the Civil War simply as a fight between an industrial society and an agricultural society, as sometimes people like to do. In a certain sense, that view reverses the cause and effect of the war. Yes, the war did stimulate industrial development dramatically in the North, but that is not the cause of the war. Um, and particularly in the West, you had very few of these large factories. More interesting is just the wide dispersion of mechanical skill in northern society. It was argued by anti-slavery people with merit, I think, that slavery suppresses labor skill. It, it's, it, makes, labor un, uh, it, it, it makes labor disreputable uh, because it's associated with slavery. Um, and much manufacturing, so small scale, was done actually on plantations by slaves themselves. But in the, in the North, the old Northwest, you have this wide dispersion of, of, of mechanical skill, which is essential for economic development in the future, and also for the conduct, as we'll see, of the Civil War itself. So the United States in, 18, in the 1850s has moved a long way from, let's say, a generation or two earlier. It now has a large wage-earning class in cities, many of them immigrants, but um, you know, a lot of work is now done by, for, by wage workers, not simply people working in their own shops or farms. Um, but the ideal of economic independence and the reality of small farms, small shops, small manufacturing is still real enough to make it um, you know, to make it a plausible uh, ideal for, for the society. It was still a society with broad economic opportunity in the North, especially for native-born people. Immigrants are facing a somewhat different world. So this kind of small-scale market capitalist society is what we sometimes refer to as Lincoln's America. This is the world that Republicans knew and were trying to uh, preserve. 